we frequently hear things like the algorithms or social media platforms are manipulating us, but I've never really understood what exactly that means. Look, if Facebook shows me an advertisement for a towel because they somehow understand that I'm looking for towels and then I buy a towel, I don't feel that I've been unduly manipulated or something like that. So what do I need to get all worked up about? And so I've been thinking a lot about what constitutes manipulation. When is it objectionable? Is it always objectionable? And one thing that I've been thinking about are things like, it doesn't seem obvious to me that if you just incentivize me to do something, let's say you offer me some money to do something that you've thereby manipulated me, even though you've now played some role in my doing that thing. And if you appeal to my desires or my passions, that also seems fine. If I really love rock climbing, if you throw, show me some ads for rock climbing gear and then I buy the rock climbing gear, you have in some sense preyed on my desire to climb, but I don't know. That doesn't feel like manipulation to me either. What exactly is manipulation? Why should we care? This is what led me to talk to Michael Clank, who's been working on this topic for a long time. And he's got a particular view about what constitutes manipulation that strikes me as at least generally plausible. The general view is something like you're being manipulated when someone is trying to get a certain kind of outcome from you, and they don't really care how they get you to do that thing. It's a kind of indifference to the means to the end. It's not complete. It doesn't have to be something like full sociopath where, you know, if they could kill someone and get you to do it, they would do it. But so there's some guardrails. But the, the general view is that they don't really care what gets you to do the thing that they want you to do. That's what manipulation looks like on Michael's account, and we'll explore it in our conversation. This is after he goes through some of the more standard conceptions of what constitutes manipulation and, and explains why they're not very good. So, for instance, he talks about why some people think that a manipulator necessarily has bad intentions, but that's not true because there could be benevolent manipulators, right? Let's suppose I manipulate you into eating healthier for your sake. I've manipulated you, but it's still mo motivated by benevolence or compassion or something like that. So it's not because I have bad intentions. He talks about accounts of manipulation that have to do with speaking to your emotions. But then as he says, and I intimated earlier with the, the comment about rock climbing, appealing to people's emotions isn't necessarily manipulative. And in fact, sometimes our emotions, as I put it in, a, in our discussion, they partially constitute our rational engagement with the world. It's, it's rational and meaningful to connect with the world through our emotions to say, love rock climbing or our family or something along those lines. It's just appealing to emotions can't be what constitutes manipulation. And there's also a really good case where we talk about you can even manipulate someone even if you give them a really good reason, a really good reasons or a good argument for doing something. But you can give that argument, if you like, insincerely. And so it still constitutes manipulation. Those are some of the ideas that we're going to go through. And Michael thinks they're all false. They're all wrong. And what we should really be focusing on is manipulation being a matter of getting people to do things without really caring how you get them to do it. Whatever works, as he says at one point. Now, if you think about manipulation in the way that Michael does, you might ask, is manipulation always bad? And there is something that's, I think, he thinks, always bad about manipulation. And it's something like this. In an ideal relationship with someone, you're engaging in what you can call joint deliberation. You're thinking together. And there's a certain ideal of what constitutes good joint deliberation or what constitutes a good relationship with that person. And so while you could in some ways manipulate, say, a loved one in not such a bad way, you didn't get them to do anything wrong, maybe even you didn't do anything wrong, nonetheless, the way in which you're interacting with that person makes it the case that you're falling short of a certain ideal of the relationship or of an ideal of joint deliberation. And of course, this all relates to AI because, of course, AI or algorithms are indifferent to how they get you to do the thing. They don't care why you do the thing. They just want you to do the thing. Maybe it's click on this ad, maybe spend more time on the website, whatever it is. And so AI manifests this kind of indifference. And relatedly, the developers, the AI developers, they are probably indifferent as well because they're also just trying to get you to click on the thing to say in the platform, whatever it is. And so there is a form of manipulation taking place online, so says Michael. But it's not this sort of necessarily nefarious attitude that AI or the developers of AI have towards people that are interacting with the platform. It's just this indifference, which is the falling short of an ideal of what constitutes joint deliberation or good relationship. I think Michael's account of manipulation is totally plausible. I think it's very interesting. I also think it raises other kinds of questions that we did not get to explore, which is something like, what kinds of relationships do we expect to have with these platforms? I've got certain ideals about my relationship with my wife and what looks like good joint deliberation. I'm not sure I have that same thought about what constitutes a good or a joint deliberative 
enterprise or exercise with, say, a Facebook or an Instagram or a LinkedIn or whatever it is. So I think the conversation raises important questions about what constitutes a good or an ideal relationship with these various platforms and what can we reasonably expect of those platforms. All right, that's all that I have to say by way of intro. It's a great conversation. As usual, please like the podcast, share with your friends, just do all the things, please. All right, thanks so much. Let's go talk to Michael. All right, so Michael, if I understand your view rightly, there's a common view of manipulation that you think is just wrong. And then there's an alternative view of what constitutes manipulation that obviously you think is the right one. So first of all, do I have that right so far? And if so, first, walk me through what you think is the common conception or conceptions of manipulation and where they go wrong. Yeah, so a key tenet of it is that manipulation is uh, some form of malicious interference in the business of somebody else. Uh, that requires two components. Uh, one is the intention um, to influence somebody else. Now, that is pretty uncontroversial and I think required because we want to distinguish manipulation from purely accidental influence. Sure. Because I can be an influencer and I can wear some branded hat on my head. You see my video that influences you to buy it, but me as an influencer hasn't manipulated you to buy that hat. I don't think so. Yeah. So what I think about when I think about accidental influence, and perhaps I'm as a private person, I'm wearing a, a cologne and I pass you in the street and that has an influence on you as you, you smell it, but that is, seems purely accident. I think with an influencer already, there might be a sort of intention behind what they do. Um, so we might classify sure. that as a kind of purposeful or intentional influence, but I think that's pretty yeah. uncontroversial. Uh, Okay. And also something that I accept. What I think is more problematic, but still very widespread, is the idea that what the manipulator does is something malicious, nefarious, and bad intentioned. So typical views are that the manipulator tries to influence you behind the back. They try to subvert or bypass your rationality. They try to mm. harm you in some way, undermine your autonomy, perhaps induce a mistake in your beliefs desires or emotions. And all of these things seem to be pretty bad. And I think that asks too much of the manipulator that really portrays the manipulator as a malicious, nefarious actor who's really committed to that kind of you know, bad outcome. So I could see the undermining bit. I could, there, there's one aspect of the definition you just offered, which was undermining of something or other, autonomy or rational capacity, something along those lines. The nefarious bit doesn't seem to be necessary, though, as I, as I think you're, you're getting at, which is because I can manipulate you with good intentions. I can manipulate you in a paternalistic manner to try to get you to do what's good for you. And that would still so, count as a manipulation, but it'd be, I don't think that benevolent manipulation doesn't sound oxymoronic or, or self-contradictory or something along those lines. Nope, I agree. It's, I think, and many do make room for that. So the, the large debate about nudging, for example recognizes that there might be mm. nudges, which if you follow the, the idea, then they are by definition intended for good outcomes for the recipient. What current views of manipulation still have in common is that the means by which they achieve or, or by which the manipulation okay. comes about, these means are still on the nefarious, bad, undermining side. And I think current views of manipulation okay. portray manipulation as intended to take this problematic path. And the, the contrast case, what uh, I and other people have been thinking about is simply that you might use very good, reasonable arguments to manipulate. And in that case, there, mm -hmm. there's nothing that is, it's not in the means or the outcome of the influence where it detects this nefariousness or the badness. Okay, so a couple of things. So one thing that you're saying, I take it is, it's, Manipulation is standardly conceived of as a bad thing, independently of the ends to which you are shooting, the, the goal towards which you're striving. Because there's something about the manipulation is about a certain kind of method or a set of methods or a set of processes that are itself morally objectionable. Your point, I take, is that no, no, there are methods of manipulation that are perfectly on the moral up and up. Do I, do I have that right so far? Um, I, I think to, to start with, you can distinguish it amongst the kind of at least three types of views about manipulation that are common. 
One is indeed that manipulation is tied to specific outcomes. So manipulation always leads to a loss of autonomy or a harm for the, the person that is targeted. I think this is wrong because, as you just suggested, there are cases of paternalistic manipulation or manipulation yeah, to, for the ultimate good of the person being manipulated. Others sure. try to locate the manipulation in the way the influence comes about. So the process, so let's call them process views. And sure. perhaps the, the poster boy of these views is the idea that manipulation proceeds by emotional influence. So that's mm, yeah. usually people draw a contrast. So there's this high road and that's rational, reasonable influence and that contrast exploiting and using your emotions. I think this is also problematic okay. because we often need emotional decision making. Emotional decision making is not as such bad. Do you have in mind something like if you get me to care for my child in a certain way that I wasn't caring for them before? Yeah. By playing on my love for my child in a way that yeah. I wasn't previously appreciating. Yeah. That would be a kind of process emotional manipulation, but yes. it would be on the ethical up and up. Yes, I think that's true. I think that would even be a, because some of these views say that if you use emotional influence, it's kind of efficient for manipulation. I think that might be a, a counterexample yeah. to these views, because I think just because I appeal to your emotions, that doesn't make something manipulative, at least not in a morally problematic way. Yeah. I think there's going to be some kinds of, there's a way of characterizing emotions as animalistic, as non-rational at, yep. at a minimum, if not irrational in some cases. And there's surely some cases where, I think at least there are surely some cases of manipulation in which someone is preying on those non-rational emotions. But there's also cases of rational emotion that point us or that exactly. are that either are constitute our attunement to what's of value. So when I love my children, it's not, it might be rational in the sense that it's attuned to the value of my children or the value of parenthood or the value of our relationship or something along those lines. Similarly, love of music or something like that. That might be an emotion that I have, but it's the appropriate response to music. It's a rational response to the value of music. So we can't just say writ large manipulation just is the sort of tinkering of people's emotions because some of those emotions are the rational engagements with the world. So we're just falling away. I think I didn't catch the last part, but I think you said that we cannot just equate manipulation with the tinkering of emotions. Because some of those emotions are rational engagements with constitute, yeah, at yeah. least in part, rational engagement with the world. Yeah, yeah. fully agree. Thanks. So. And so what this shows is that we cannot just have this blunt view, emotions are bad, irrational influence, that has been another you know, major view that says the yeah. manipulator intentionally tries to bypass or subvert, I think here the, the more important one is to subvert your rationality, perhaps by yeah. instilling an emotion that is in that situation irrational. And I think here, so now we're more at the point because now we see manipulation as something that can have ultimately good outcomes, but still we see it as something that is intended to, as a bad thing in the sense of it's intended to subvert your rationality. So it's intended to use a means that right. is not per se good. So that's your counter take. That's the one that you want to dig deep into. That's the one you want to defend. No, that's Manipulation what I want to, is... I want to get away from that. One step of... That one too you don't like. Yes. What, why don't you like this one? Yeah, so because philosophers have pointed out, and I followed that path, is that there's also cases where I might use good rational arguments in a manipulative way. And, and that suggests that this irrationality, this appeal to irrational uh, means of influence, that's not necessary for manipulation after all. So is, is an example of that sort of thing where it's something like, I give you an argument in the rational sense of the term argument, I give you strong reasons, good reasons for doing X, whatever it is, yep. going to the store now. But they're insincerely offered yep. because by you, getting you to go to the store, I can go do the nefarious thing. So I tell you, let's say, I don't know, let's be married in this situation and I give yep. you good reasons for going to the grocery store to go get milk or whatever it is. Yep. But I'm doing it so that I can have the time to have a phone call with my mistress. Exactly. So I think that's the, the word that you mentioned, insincerity, that's a very important one. I think that gets very close to the heart of it. Like an ingenious example was offered back in 2014 by Moti Gorin. He envisioned this case of where you have an, a, a strong believer in God, a theist, and that person really hangs their 
basically they think their life depends and the, the, the meaning of life depends on their being a god. And now you want mm. to get at the inheritance of that person. And now you tell them, give them good rational arguments for the non-existence of God. And then that person ends up killing themselves. So mm. that in example is a very crass case intended to show that you give good, true, reasonable arguments for a true conclusion, let's suppose, but it still seems yeah. utterly manipulative. And yeah, and I think that the case that you give is much more mundane, much more realistic. I think the world, <laughs> sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. and I think the world is, and that is really what, why I'm convinced of this view. The world is choke full of these examples where we just want to get something out of another person. We want them to buy our shit, uh, sorry, buy our products, surf on our website. Shit is fine. If you want to sell shit, that's fine. Good. <laughs> Vote for us and do what we want. And we basically think about the most effective way to get them to do it. Yeah. I've had this recently. My daughter was saying she's eight and she was saying something like, I forgot exactly what it was, but that she felt bad for one of her classmates. Mm. And I believed her, but she kept saying it. And at one point I said, I know that you feel bad for your classmate, but I think the reason you're saying it now is so that we think that you're a good person, that you're a good and kind person. Mm. And she smiled yeah. and she said, but I, she said, I do feel bad. I said, I know that you feel bad, but that's not the reason you're telling us that you feel bad. You're telling us that you feel bad yep. because you want us to think that you're a kind person. Yep. And she, she admitted it. She agreed. So it was, she was engaging in a form of manipulation and that's at eight. So now I'm a little bit worried for what happens at 15. Let me get a grip on where we are. So we're trying to find an account of manipulation. And in a minute, I'm going to ask you why it matters yes. that we get the account right. But I want to get the whatever's on the menu. I want to get it out. I want yep. to get it out. Yep. The first one I take it was this sort of that manipulation requires nefariousness. We said, no, no, manipulation doesn't require nefariousness because you could do it paternalistically for their good. So that's one re that's the sort of first kind of account of manipulation that you want to reject. Let's say negative outcomes. Sure. Negative outcomes. Sure. That's fine. Okay. Second one, second kind of manipulation or counter manipulation that you want to reject is what you call process manipulation. Yep. And it sounds like there are two varieties of that. One was the process is one in which you appeal to their emotions, and that's no good because yep. there are rational emotions. And the other kind of process of counter manipulation is one where it's a process by which the rationality of the other is undermined, of the target is undermined. But that's no good because you could have good arguments given to the person that uh, constitute your manipulation. Yep. And so what we're waiting for, I take it, is some third account, your account yes. of manipulation. Is that right? Is that where we are? Yes. In a minute, because I want to summarize these two views, the, the process views and the outcome views. Take them together. Yeah. And I, I think that yeah. both of them still, that the fundamental idea is that manipulation is nefarious influence. It's either influence aimed at a bad outcome or it's influence mm. aimed at a bad, deficient process. And... Both mm. of them ascribe quite a lot to the manipulator in terms of the manipulator is committed to achieving this bad outcome or committed to instilling mm. that bad process. And now here's the step to, I think, the new view of manipulation, which asks less of the manipulator and just says the manipulator is indifferent to some ideal interaction. They want to influence you effectively and they just don't care how they do that as long as it is um, hmm. effective. And what the, the crucial point here is, I'm not committed to some bad outcome. I'm merely indifferent to some good, positive constraint on how to, uh, to influence other people. All right, so give me an example of this. I don't, yeah, give me an example. So I think that the online world lends itself well to examples. So. Many people have the intuition that recommender systems are manipulative and this indifference view would explain why, because they have a clear goal. In many cases, it's the, to increase retention rates on a website and they optimize mm. for that goal. And how they reach that goal is absolutely unconstrained by any uh, goal to reveal reasons to the user that doesn't say, here's why you really have good reason to watch this next weird YouTube video. It just says, I can look at, at Reed's history, at comparable users, and yeah. this is what I guess will work for him. Okay, let me try an example based on that, but not using yep. recommender systems yet. Um, although I do want to get into that. I think that you think that certain kinds of salespeople 
can be yep. manipulators, yep. but they're agnostic about the truth or falsity of what they're saying. They don't, they're agnostic about whether this is good or bad. So back in the day, before I started graduate school, after I, I finished college, for one summer, I worked at a rental car company. And among the things I was asked <laughs> to do was to sell insurance for yep. the cars. You know, you want to sell in case something happens. And so I was given a variety of techniques by which I could sell people insurance. Yep. But let's suppose I was agnostic or I hadn't thought very much, let's say, about whether these techniques were undermining of autonomy or preying on base emotions or whatever it was. I just, I didn't think very much about it. I was just told to say these things, so I would say them. Yeah. And let's say I'm also agnostic about whether them having insurance is good for them or bad for them. Maybe I say, I don't know. Maybe they're, the insurance that they have anyway is fine. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I don't yep. care. I just know that I should say these kinds of things in this kind of order, as I was told by the sales training program to elicit the outcome that I want, which is for the customer to buy insurance for the rental car. Yep. So that would be a case of manipulation, but I'm indifferent to the means, indifferent to the end. Yes. yes. Is that a fair picture? Yes. And I think this is, it's a fair picture. And I think this is why the indifference view gives you a good picture of the manipulation. Because when I look with, the, say, the traditional perspective, and I'm trying to ascertain whether you had the intention to lead me astray or whether you had the intention to undermine autonomy, whether you had the intention. Yeah, I just didn't have one. Yes. Then, um, well, then I'm basically a miss here. And I think this is why this is a more accurate characterization of the phenomenon. Yeah. Okay. So by these lights, intending to manipulate is not a necessary condition of being manipulative. Yeah, intending not. to do harm, Definitely. intending to do harm is not a necessary Definitely condition. Not. Suppose I say something like this. It sounds to me like you're spelling out cases in which, like the salesperson case or the bullshitter case, and there's probably lots of overlap between those yep. two kinds of cases, yep. is one in which there's manipulation, but the person doesn't care that they're being manipulative. Yeah. But if I said that just means that, I, I still want to know what the hell of manipulation is, yep. as opposed to other forms of influence. Yep. It can still say manipulation is a, is a, is a specific form of influence about which the person engaged in it might not care that they're doing it. Yep. Or might not care about the harm or the benefit that they produce. Yep. Right? So I still don't have an account of manipulation on your view. I have the absence of a requirement for something to be a case of manipulation, but I still yep. don't know what manipulation actually is in a positive sense. Is that yep. fair? I think there is a, there's a view on that. And so in my view, that's basically two conditions. One is that you want to, so you, you engage in influence to, to have a certain effect. That's not accidental. And the explanation of why you choose that particular means of influence, why you say this rather than saying that, why you say the insurance is good for you when you're 80 years old, or why you say all your friends have this insurance, why you choose these different tactics, or your wife would recommend this insurance. And the explanation for why you choose any of them is not to reveal reasons to your interlocutor. And I think that's a crucial distinction from persuasion. Persuasion is, I think, to be trying to, to reveal these reasons. And I think that's the essence of manipulation. And that's definition. A s Do you think most... Okay, so the positive definition is mm -hmm. you're trying to achieve an outcome and the means by which you achieve that outcome is more or less through whatever it takes. Maybe there might be, there's some going to be some guardrails, yep. right? Some people are not going to, if death threats would work, they still wouldn't do it. That would be beyond the pale for them. So they're not going to do, yep. they're not going to go that far, but it's something like, I don't care if I have to say X or Y, as long as I get them yep. to do the thing or even to believe the thing, whatever it is. Yep. So do, then do you think, are most salespeople, well, okay, one question is whether being manipulative in this sense entails that something is morally bad. So Good. Is the manipulator, especially because they're associated with the bullshit, are, are manipulators, by virtue of being manipulators on the account you've given of what it is to manipulate, is it ethically bad? I guess that's the first question. Yes. So I think there's a... I haven't really figured it out completely, but I think there's a... It's a non-ideal form of influence because it's, <laughs> sure. it yeah. starts from this ideal of human interaction where we try to reveal reasons to each other, aid each other's understanding. And the background idea is that yeah. we have engaged in some form of common pursuit of truth and reasons for what we have reasons to. In that sense, yeah. we always, there's like a detriment to that. I'm not taking the high road. 
But I think it might be perfectly fine in many situations and outweighed by pragmatic considerations when you are in a close relationship and you have some, that there's probably lots of manipulation going on in a very benign sense. So let, yeah, so let's take this case again of me telling my wife, giving her reasons to go to the grocery store. Not because I want to talk to my mistress, but just because I want some time alone. Yep. I just need a little bit of me time. I just need... St- I, and so I tell my wife, hey, maybe we should go to the grocery store, pick up X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. And I give her, while you're there, you can pick up that thing that you wanted to pick up, whatever yep. it was. And it's perfectly acceptable for me to make those kinds of suggestions. I have really given her good reasons, yep. but I'm indifferent. I have this attitude of a difference. Towards, I'm just saying these things. I wanted to get her out of the house. Yep. That was really my goal. Yep. And so you might think you didn't do the wrong thing. I didn't do the wrong thing in getting her to go out. Mm. I didn't do the wrong thing in giving her the reasons. Mm. Nonetheless, there's something shitty about my character in that situation. My, mm. The way that I chose to engage. Surely a, a better way to have approach the situation was yep. to say, hey, listen, I could use a little bit of time to just chill. <laughs> maybe you can go out and give her the actual real reason why I'm, I'm doing it. Yep. And then so it's maybe I'm not, I haven't wronged her. I haven't betrayed her. I haven't wronged her. I haven't betrayed her, arguably. But nonetheless, there's something morally deficient about the way that I chose to interact with her. Yeah, so I would agree with that. And there's an interesting question whether, you know, different views of manipulation might be actually talking past each other or might be compatible in so far as some are talking about the action, the reasons that are mm. given or the emotions that are stoked and they try to evaluate what makes that manipulation. And others, more likely my account, are perhaps more interested in what is the, in evaluating the motivation of the manipulator or the source of the yeah. motivation. But I think there's a close connection. It doesn't It's not really that, that far apart. So let's take a step back and explain to me as a, I don't know, I hate saying I'm a philosopher, but whatever, yep. as a, at least as a former philosophy professor, if not a yep. philosopher, whatever. I could see why this is, this is intellectually interesting for its own sake, as it were, just trying to figure out what the hell is manipulation. Mm. But is there a bigger picture about why it matters that we get the account of manipulation right? And you started getting at it with talking about recommender systems, so I wonder if yep. that's part of the bigger picture. Yep. So what's the, is there a bigger picture? Is there, a, is there, if you like, a pragmatic upshot? Does it, does it say something about our yes. interactions with other people and or with, say, recommender systems or other forms of AI? Why does all this matter that we get it right? Yeah, so I won't want to any kind of, self psychoanalysis why I'm interested in, in, in manipulation. <laughs> no. But the philosophical journey was that I, I also did meta ethics in, in my PhD and I was concerned with evolutionary debunking. But the, the long story, the, the basic mm. of it is basically that there's all these hidden influences on our moral beliefs, new yeah. kinds of evolutionary psychological explanations. And that has interesting philosophical ramifications. And it, this is this old fascination with why do we believe what we believe? Is it, am I the master of my ship here or is this some kind of dark hidden in? I think this was there to begin with. And then around you know, after my PhD, 2018, 19, the media was full of the Cambridge Analytica scandal at Facebook. And everywhere you would read the claim, Facebook, big tech is manipulating us. They are manipulating. Yeah, sure. They are manip- manipulation is everywhere. And yeah, yep. I, I felt the pull of social media, like you, you have to check LinkedIn every five minutes or something. So I felt, okay, this is weird what's going on. And so I had a personal research project on first the ethics of social media and manipulation would, would have been one part of that research project to figure out is social media yeah. manipulative. And then basically I, I discovered this, what felt like a green field. Lots of claims about mm. manipulation, but no theories yeah. really. So mm. this claim that Facebook is manipulating us was rarely, if ever, substantiated by saying something yeah. like, Facebook is manipulating us because the conditions of manipulation are one, two, three, and these conditions are met. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Kind of You're airing. definitely not going to find that in popular media. No. But also then it's, of course, this was also already an academic debate. And mm. it was also completely lacking. So that's interesting. A couple of things. Number one, I saw a conversation with Soshana Zuboff of Surveillance Capitalism mm. fame and Luciano Florida, who now is a professor at Yale, right? And they had mm. this conversation about manipulation and targeted ads. Mm. And they kept talking about how it's an affront to human dignity. And I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. I just yep. thought, 
I don't know. Facebook shows me an ad for a towel yep. that I think is cool because the sand doesn't stick to it. So it's great for the beach. And then <laughs> I buy a towel. I don't think my human dignity has been undermined by virtue of them serving yeah. me this ad for a towel. So I just never understood it. And then other times I just thought, and I posted about, I had literally just a LinkedIn post, mm-hmm. not some big article that I wrote. Just what's manipulation? If they show me something that I reasonably want and then I buy it, great. If they show me something that makes me happier, great. They add, where's the manipulation? Exactly. In, in some cases, they're just giving me reasonable incentives or something along those lines. If they appeal to my emotions, to our early points, so what? But my life is largely constituted by my emotions. I love rock climbing, and so I buy rock climbing gear. I don't feel that because my love was used for rock climbing that I've been manipulated, or I love my children, and so they show me something that my children would love. I don't think that I've been manipulated because they preyed on my love for my children. That seems like a reasonable thing mm-hmm. to prey on in, in a sort of non-pejorative sense. Yeah, I could see why you'd also, your philosophical antennae would be raised and ask, what do you mean by manipulation? Yeah, and yeah, from then on, it was basically a kind of, Endlessly fascinating story, I really have to say. That there's some good philosophy already, and that was there for some years. That really interestingly picked up, of course, in recent years because of the concerns about new technology and manipulation. So that was something that I could latch onto and build on. Do you think that all these claims about social media being manipulative, I view with a great deal of skepticism? Mm-hmm. I'm not inclined to believe the technologists when they say, oh, we can push these buttons in your head and we can make people dance and we can get them to yep. hit the like button. And we can get them to... Bu-. I think that's bullshit. That's a nice way of engaging in some self-aggrandizement. Yep. Look how powerful we are. But I don't really buy it. Is that your view? Do you think that it actually is quite powerful? Is there a robust literature on this with which I'm unfamiliar? So there's a large literature on behavior change methods that's mainly from the medical health field. So basically... How can I intervene and help you get rid of smoking and your alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, mm. or not? Yeah. Results that there's really systematic review studies done. The results are these behavior change interventions are have modest effects. And there, of course, they decide problems with difficulty of interacting with your health practitioners. They are not always there. Talk to them once a month and then they're gone. I think that's this theory-driven behavior change is one aspect. And the other aspect is the behavioral economics literature, which has a similar kind of, Hmm. uh, the idea here is, okay, we now understand much better how human beings make decisions. It's much less rational than commonly thought. So let's use that to influence them in a more effective way. And the proponents of nudging, of course, say it has massive effects. (laughs) Critics say it has very little uh, effects and sure, all there's so one, there's very little empirical review work on that that kind of rigorously tests these grandiose claims. And what there is shows that there's really only small effects so far. Yeah. And these people making the grand claims, they have financial incentives to say the really big thing, right? If you're a behavioral economist yep. and you go around saying, look at how powerful this stuff is and what it can do, the financial incentive to saying such things, aside from selling books and being interviewed in the news and all, is that then you get hired yep. by all these businesses to sell stuff. But it's the same. It, just, it just reeks to me of uh, self-service. Yeah, it's the same. There's also a risk, of course, that if you are a critic of all of these developments and you want to point out that there's risks, then you might also overplay uh, the actuality of the problem right now. Because that, of course, also serve, would serve your end or my end because I'm writing articles about well, the ethics of manipulation. and. Sure. Um, so people better take it seriously, if, as far as I'm concerned. So there's two things I want to say. I'm not exactly sure if they fit together or how they fit together. The one is that I take it that your account of manipulation allows us to say things like the algorithm is manipulative. Yeah. And the algorithm is manipulative because it doesn't have attitudes. And so it's indifferent. It has no attitude towards mm. whether or not the reasons or what it's showing you is good or bad or whatever, it's as it were just trying to produce an outcome. It's trying to produce the outcome for which the algorithm was optimized. Mm. And if you think that intention is necessary, then you just don't get to say things like algorithms are manipulative for the reason that they don't have intentions. And so that's, I take it, a, a, a good thing about your account. That's a nice thing that we get to say things like the algorithm is manipulative. Yep. So that's nice. And then I take it that the other thing that sort of piggybacks on this is you might think, not you might think, you do think, and I think it's plausible 
that there's something deficient about the relationship between a manipulator and the target of manipulation. That there's something, even if the wrong thing isn't being, at least this is the way that I characterized it earlier, even if the wrong thing's not being done, there's something deficient there. I located it in something like the character of the person. I guess we could say something, if, I don't know if this is metaphorical or not, but the character of the algorithm, so to speak. There's something deficient. There's something morally bad there. I think it's a problem with the relationship. So to give the example, again, of giving my wife the good reasons to go to the store so that I could have some alone time, there's something deficient about that method of communication. And so then you might think that the extent to which our relationships with each other are mediated by necessarily manipulative algorithms, because they can't have the attitudes, that's making for a bad, deficient society more generally. There's other bad things going on in the world, but that, just that algorithmic mediation is itself a form of necessarily increased manipulation. Yeah, let's... So I said that before. I'm not sure I would stand by that now, whether they need to be necessary. Yeah. Man- because so I think we the way to get rid of intention in your view of, man- in a view of manipulation is, I think, to talk about the purpose of the influence. So why am I doing saying this? Why, why are you saying to your wife, hey, you should go to the store and buy some salad? Why do you do that? And now yeah. here's an explanation of that. And in so far as if there, this kind of serves a purpose, why you say that, I think this is a potential candidate for manipulation. Then we just need to ask, why do you say it? Are you indifferent to the revealing reasons? If so, you are manipulated. Yeah. But we can say that Animals are manipulative because they show purposeful behavior, even though they might lack intentions in the full-blown sense. And algorithms can be manipulated because they show purposeful behavior in the sense that they do something because they want to achieve Hmm. some goal. Now, it's an interesting question whether algorithms can be, or algorithmic systems can be designed in a way that avoids manipulation. So can we have decision support systems whose goal whose goal is to reveal reasons to the user. To not only say, hey, buy climbing mm-hmm. gear, but here's why you should do that. Or why this is a good climb. So I'm just saying perhaps there's a way and I hope there's a way to build these systems that are not necessarily manipulated. I see. So instead of something like we're going to maximize for clicks. Yes. Rather, it's going to be, I'm going to put this sort of rather grand, but we're going to maximize for clicks on the condition that clicking actually is conducive to their welfare, like a, something like that. Yeah, or that in some weird sense, they, you understand why you have reasons to click. That's some philosophers' yes, versions right. of, face, of Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I wanted to add, I think that's a, um, actually a shocking story, is that the picture that you painted with our interactions being mediated by algorithmic systems that are perhaps necessarily manipulative. I think that's, that's an important scenario to draw attention to. And what's important, what I find important about it is that we don't need to imagine that there's these nefarious bad actors, propagandists, and evil salesmen yeah. who want to lead us astray. We can imagine that there's just good people wanting to build engaging products. Um, and in the course of that, they end up designing very effective but ultimately manipulative influence. Mm. And kind of the most illuminating example is that uh, there's this book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And Harry Brignall, yeah. the father of dark patterns, theories of work on dark patterns, points out that the hook cycle to build habit-forming products is basically a version of the dopamine addiction cycle mm. that, that is studied for a long time in the medical field. But now we have design students and people, entrepreneurs and startup people mm. who want to build great products who say, let's get this book. Let's build habit-forming products. And actually, yeah. they're building addictive stuff. And I think this is a sort of where there's an easy slippery slope into the pursuit of effective influence leads us to manipulative influence. Let me see if I have this right now. What's going on when someone manipulates us? And they could do it, as it were, directly in conversation, mm-hmm. or they could do it mediated by an algorithm. Yeah. It, it counts as a case of manipulation if it's trying to get you to act in a way that brings about the output that the manipulator wants or the outcome that the mm-hmm. manipulator wants. 
while the manipulator is indifferent to whether or not you're actually responding for good reasons. Now, if that's right, okay, if that you say that's right, but at the same time, you seem to be speaking pejoratively mm. about p designers who are acting in accordance to this get them hooked book, whatever mm. hooked. Mm. But you've also said that manipulation isn't necessarily wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So then I wonder, is the takeaway then? Look, here's what manipulation is. It happens all the time. It's how a lot of salespeople work. It's how a lot of algorithm developers work. It's as far as they're trying to get certain kinds of outcomes. Mm. They don't really care about which particular process is engaged in as long as it's not completely morally abhorrent. And that's all ethically fine. Mm. But you've also pointed to some kind of deficiency. So I'm trying to figure out yeah. how to put all these pieces together. No, good. So I think the deficiency is that in design, like in intentional designing interactions or influences or in just influencing people in in interaction, then manipulative influence just fails by this ideal, which is I influence you, but only or I make an effort to reveal reasons to you why you should believe a certain way or why you should act or desire in a certain way. And I do that because we're in a kind of cooperative shared project. We want to figure out what the world is like or what we have reason to do. And this is the ideal of social influence. And manipulation is a deviation from that ideal. And when I say, when I speak, as you say, pejoratively of designers who just get oh, build habit forming products, yeah, perhaps I need to be less harsh on them or on, on that effort. But I think it just, what I want to emphasize is that in doing so, we might lose track of this important ideal. And with my work, I want to emphasize that ideal and say, by being manipulated, we're deficient in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Let me see if I've got it. There's ideal yep. ways of being, let's just say. There's ideal ways things could go. Then there's less than ideal ways that yep. things might go, but not to the point of being blameworthy or you've done something wrong. Yep. And then there's just totally off the rails, you've done the wrong thing. Yep. To take, it ex take a non-moral example, let's say I've got a certain kind of health routine, yep. going to the gym, and my ideal is to work out this many hours and consume this many calories, whatever, and I fall short of the ideal, right? Instead of working out or whatever, five days a week, I do it four days a week. And that's less than ideal. It's fine. No blame. On the other hand, if I set that as my ideal and all I do is sit on the couch and eat Cheetos all day, all right, now maybe blame is not the appropriate attitude, but there's something like things have gone really regret. wrong here. Things have, yeah. this is definitely, yeah. I can manifest regret and maybe some other people might justifiably <laughs> ma manifest condemnation, at least for my, at least for my rank hypocrisy. Yeah. And so similarly with morality or ethics, you might think, yeah, there's some ideal, mm. the ideal way of interpersonal communications is to engage in this, I'm going to give you good reasons, you're going to respond with reasons, we can engage in this sort of deliberative, co-deliberative co project. And so that's what the ideal is. Sometimes we fall a little bit short of this yep. and we do that by manipulating. So maybe we manip manipulate in a way like giving my wife good reason to go to the store so I could have some alone time. Yeah really done the wrong thing. It's less than the ideal way of having a relationship, but I don't deserve severe condemnation or something like that. On the other hand, if I gave her disinformation, oh, you said you wanted to buy X and the X is at that store, but only for a limited time. You got to get there by two o'clock. And so she runs out to go get it. Now I've fallen so far below the ideal. I've actually gone to the realm of actual positively. I've, I've actually fallen to the realm of wrongdoing. And so I take it that some of these Algorithm designers, salespeople, the people who are developing or designing habit-producing uh, products, some of them, if you like, merely fall below the ideal, and some of them fall so far below the ideal that they're actually in the territory of wrongdoing. And as to where some particular person or company lands, that's going to depend on the particular use case in the context. Yes, and I think the context is very important because manipulating your wife to go to the store, okay, whatever. But having a conversation with your wife about, I don't know, divorce or whether to have another child and there yeah. to be just aimed for efficiency and you're not giving a fuck about revealing reasons. That is a big problem. You're still not lying. You're not still not outright out to undermine her autonomy yeah. or whatever. You're manipulating. But so that's why I think the context matters a lot. And whether we build habit forming products in context this context versus this other context where 
this ideal of shared deliberation is very much important or has much more weight. I think that's an area where there's lots of stuff still to be figured out from an ethical perspective, mm. but it's an important step beyond current focus of manipulation as an inherently intentionally bad form of influence to recognizing it's less than that and also more than that. It's less because it's just indifference, but indifference can be a very big problem. That's really helpful. It's nice or interesting to see. We need to think about the badness of manipulation, not by appealing to the badness of the motives of the person manipulating, yep. but rather we should think about it in terms of the value of relationships or the kinds of relationships that we want to foster more generally. Yeah, and the, the kind of the value of this joint deliberation that we have in this situation. The more you rely on me and that you say, I really trust you, Michael, now to lay out the reasons and to have this, that you also want to pursue truth and want to figure out what you have reason to. The more you rely on that, and I basically just manipulate you in that instance, I think then we are in trouble. That's Super amazing. fascinating. We are shaping the world, I think, but now we're going grand vision. If you're not careful, I think we're shaping the world in a way where the way we receive information and the way we exchange information will be less and less. It's not curtailed or constrained by this ideal. It's more and more constrained and governed by the aim to be effective in some sense, to believe the news, to believe what I tell you, rather than how can we build a, a situation where we both kind of exchange and work towards a shared kind of ability to appreciate the reasons for belief, desire, and emotion. And I think that's the, that's a grand kind of problem. It, but yeah, so I think the next interesting steps research-wise are to figure out more about the ethics of this manipulation, how does it change by context, and then also, of course, to think about concrete design requirements. So if we have this quite mm. nebulous idea, how can you build a recommender system that is non-manipulative? How can you build, build a yeah. mental health system that is non-manipulative? And these kind of things. So how do you design an algorithm that optimizes for getting people to do what you want them to do for the good reasons that they really ought to act on. Yep. Something along those lines. Yep. Should be easy. Good. When you figure that out, when you figure out what those criteria I'll are, let, you know. let me know. Come yep. back. Yep. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. This has been great. Thanks for having me. Agreed.